Okay, we're on. Uh, David Blattner here, uh, president of Creative Pro Network, and I'm here with Charles Nix, the creative type director at Monotype, and we're going to uh, have a conversation about type trends, technologies, and all kinds of good stuff like that. Welcome, Charles. It's it's just such a pleasure to, for us to be together. Well, thank you. Um, I hope I can match your level of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot to be enthusiastic around type. You know, you you have been a type enthusiast for a couple of years. Um, one could say <laughs> my entire life has been spent around type. T um, tell tell us about that. Why? How did you get involved with type? Well, when I was a tiny child, I mean, really tiny child, um, barely able to stand, um, I worked with my father, who was a printer, um, in our basement printing. So okay. he was a printer by by trade full time during the day. But at night, we had a printing press in our basement and we would print local flyers and church bulletins and stuff like that. Yes. And then as a family, we would have folding parties. I didn't realize it was child labor. We called them folding <laughs> parties. Um, and my mom was then in the 70s, we would have called her a stripper. Um, but later in the 80s, that changed to film assembly person. Yes, indeed. Um, yes. Got to be careful there. <laughs> So we had um, we had type around us always. Um, my you know my earliest memories of metal type were my dad's uh, sort of slugs of um, of line casters that he brought home for mm -hmm. us as kids. So I you know delivering to us little each in our, our name set in lead in lead exactly. <laughs> Don't lick this <laughs> to children. Yes, with explicit instructions not to lick it. Um, oh. I still have those. Um, yeah. But we also, you know, are surrounded by the Inland Printer, American Printer, UNLC Magazine, like these okay. things that my dad would bring home from work. So you have to imagine that this stuff, you know, by, just by osmosis, um, it would it would seep into my blood. Well, I tried I, to I, get away from it, but... Kind uh, of. I mean, <laughs> I, I have to tell you a story, though, because I once did a, a class. This is 20, 25 years ago. I did a, I, I was teaching a class back then. It was about Quark Express. And afterward, a printer came up. He was taking the class, and he said, you know, I have to just tell you, I've been printing for 20 years. Today is the first time that I ever really noticed the difference between Times and Helvetica. Oh. <laughs> and it blew my mind, right? But oh. I thought, you know, for a lot of printers, they're not looking at stuff like type design. They're not, they're not in the type. They just want to make sure it prints. In some ways, it's all images to them. Yeah. So it's interesting that you you got involved with the type side of it and the type design side of it as well as the impressions. Yeah, and I I mean there's a sort of melange of things that there I mean a lot of what you just said there that sort of made me think about the you know we talk about printing types like um Daniel Berkeley Updike's two volume book hmm. about the first 400 years of printing and it's about the first 400 years of printing. Typography is almost incidental to it. Like in order to print, you had to have type. Yeah. And people made type and people weren't like type enthusiasts. They were printers who needed yeah. this thing in order to produce their craft. But, you know, as we sort of roll into the 19th century, you start to get people paying attention to the craft of uh, letter forms. I mean, of course they were before, um, but it really sort of hit stride in the 20th century and people really started to pay attention to it. Still, it's an esoteric and sort of um, um, a, a group of people who are obsessed up until 1985, probably, um, um, who were really inside. Um, it was a lot of sort of intrinsic members of a typographic community. Mm. And then desktop publishing just exploded it. So yeah. if I think of my teaching when I first started teaching in the early 90s, um, getting people to to know that there were differences between Times Roman and Helvetica was a was a part of the job. Mm. By the time I I segued out of teaching um, in the in the you know, probably 2010, um, everyone had a favorite typeface. Yeah, coming to the class. So yeah, that awareness of typography has really changed the landscape of typography pretty dramatically. It it's so true. I remember that like in the late 80s that uh, all of a sudden Fontographer came out and people were suddenly able, We, were, I was able, I mean, from nowhere, I was able to start b making fonts myself. And the power of that was, uh, was heady. I and mean, there was a sense of, wait a minute, they're not just something from outside that other people do. This is something that I could actually get my hands on 
uh, and do myself. That's and that has only gotten bigger and better ever since then, of course. Yeah. So when I was I was maybe I think I was probably eleven or twelve when I did my first lettering job, one that got mm. reproduced, mm. Um, and that was hand drawn. And then when I was drawing typefaces in college, they were still hand drawn, like ink on on Bristol board. Wow. But then right after I graduated, the Macintosh came out and Fontographer sort of was birthed and, mm. and life changed completely. This sort of laborious process of making type prior to that sort of gave way to this almost too easy to, <laughs> to get into. Um, but I felt very well served by the time that I'd spent in the wilderness of pre-digital, pre-postscript mm. um, drawing of type. So what, what is it about type that fascinates you? What, what just grabs you? Why type, of all things? I, th I mean, I think there's just the, uh, uh, like everyone else, the sort of the variety is really um, probably the charismatic aspect of it. But the philosophic aspect of it that I really respond to hmm. um, is, the, is that, um, that thin veneer, that moment, um, that sort of layer between language um, and the world in which we live. So that, that type sits at that, that intersection of the physical world and the, and the, and the world of thought. Mm. And as it sits there, it's not a passive player. It's actually changing the meaning of the words. It's modulating them. Um, it's offering its own sort of psychology on top of the, the words themselves. And I find that um, endlessly fascinating, endlessly sort of quizzical, um, and I'll, I, you know, I'm addicted to it. I need to w learn more all the time. Isn't that strange, though? In some ways, I find it really strange that type and these the incredibly small changes in type could have such an effect on us. And it really does. I mean, sometimes it's obvious, right? Sometimes there's a sense of, OK, that's Comic Sans. And <laughs> and there's, you know, and it but it does have an effect on our our understanding of what's going on, our feeling about what's being communicated. And yet it's just differences, tiny little differences in. Well, and I would take it a step further. I mean, there is that. Um, so the way a word is shaped or the way a line of text is shaped or a sentence can actually make that text um, or the mass of text, the book page or a paragraph of text can make it either more inviting, sort of more conducive to comprehension by bringing you into it or it can push you further away from it. So you think of like the long lines of type in a mm. contract that are set mm. in very small point sizes that are too long for the measure, too many characters, and that sort of intentional um, creation of a, a setting of type that is not inviting to read, mm -hmm. that requires extra effort, as mm. opposed to something that's really cared for, like a you know book designed by Bradbury Thompson, where you see type that begs you to read it. That, mm. that welcomes you in, that wants to communicate to you. Um, so it's not just the shape of the letters, but it's also that sort of the, the form and the use together that I find True. Um, also fascinating. And, and that makes sense to me. So, okay, so, so this is about the design of type and choosing type, but I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the technology of type, because that's, that's, always one of my I geek out on that as well of course. Like, like I said from the very beginning I was using Fontographer and playing around with type 3 fonts and then we got into type 1 fonts and then we got open type fonts and now we, we there's always new stuff in the technology of fonts uh, which I find fascinating so what what uh, what's new what what do you think we should talk about what do people need to know about uh, and actually I, I do want to open it it could be about the design as well what's new in the design <laughs> Or the well, technology. I, I think we can bookend it, um, actually, because if, we, I mean, if we're talking about Fontographer, what was happening back in um, back in the early 80s, actually, with type, mm -hmm. those first postscript typefaces, like Hel Neue Helvetica from 1983, mm -hmm. it was a postscript type one typeface. And so that was back then a sort of two part um, font. If you remember, it's hard yeah. to, uh, I mean, I can say this um, and we're going to, half of the people listening to this will not have a clue as to what I'm talking about, but those fonts had a screen representation and they had a printer representation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and eventually you didn't need the screen representation. The, sc the printer representation was able to be broadcast onto the screen. So, mm -hmm. but initially they were, they were two part fonts and they wouldn't work if you didn't have both pieces. I remember the level of complexity. Um, yeah. so if you can imagine that as sort of the dawn of, of type and imagine that, um, or digital type, sorry, um, not even digital type, postscript type. If you can sure. imagine that is one bracket on the conversation, that's being sunsetted finally. Hmm. That's 30, how many, how many years is it? 37 years? Something like that, yeah. Uh, 38 yeah. years. Um, no other software has functioned for 38 years. No, nope. I mean, there are probably some tiny pieces of software somewhere, <laughs> but this is a major piece of software that yeah. has been functioning for people for, for a long, long time, for decades. Um, so if you had a Neue Helvetica from 1983 um, and you had the printer font for it, up until recently, you'd still be able to install it on your system. But that, um, you know, that as we, you may or may not know, is being sunsetted as people are segueing into purely open type and true type fonts. And then if we go to the other side, this sort of, um, this new um, uh, variable font format is probably the other bracket to the, mm -hmm. to the current conversation. Mm-hmm. So, um, so the PostScript Type 1 discussion, I think, is fascinating because some of us have been freaking out about this. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, been, it's, been slowly, um, it's been slowly disappearing from Windows and, Apple, uh, and Mac. I think they're not supporting it as much. But Adobe, we always expected Adobe to, to maintain the support of Type 1 fonts. It was, after all, originally Adobe's format. Um, it'd be like... In my opinion, it's like all of a sudden saying, yeah, we, you can't use the TIFF format or you can't use JPEG graphic formats anymore. It's just a format that you're storing this information in. My feeling is they should keep it around. I mean, how hard could it be? <laughs> but, but you used a word which I think is important. You said this is software, how long software has been around. I don't usually think of fonts as software, mm. but they are, right? Yep. Yeah, and you could think of PostScript Type 1 as sort of the PostScript inside of PostScript. Um, it's sort of like a, yeah. a, a language of describing a page that exists within a language of describing a page. So, um, <laughs> that's true. So uh, it's all, it is, I mean, that's why so many weird things can happen when people install fonts that have bad information in them. It's because it's the, it is this little sort of mini robot inside of your robot. <laughs> That if it's if it's functioning fine, it's fine. But if it's not, um, it will it can really mess up your system because it's it's got its own sort of internal logic going on. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, it, it is software, and um, and I think it was Matthew Carter who said who brought that up in in one discussion, um, a panel discussion, uh, that idea that nobody expects any piece of software that was developed three and a half decades ago to continue to function. Um, That's true. But we in the type industry have created the sort of almost indestructible <laughs> piece of software that just kept functioning. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. But I, I still have type one fonts. I have, I have a lot of type, fun, type one fonts on my machine still. Yep. And Adobe has said, that's it. We're just going to stop supporting it. It's actually a little unclear to me whether they will keep supporting it behind the scenes, but not officially. Yeah. For example... You, I'm sure you remember multiple master fonts, yes. which was sort of a failed technology from the 90s, um, which in some ways was the, the early genesis or the early ideas that later turned into variable font mm -hmm. uh, technology. But um, multiple master fonts, I believe, still technically work in Adobe InDesign, weirdly, I've if you have instances. That. But <laughs> it, it seems to work if you have instances already pre-built. Uh, but there's no, you know, there's certainly no official support for it. So I personally think that Adobe will, it'll keep, these fonts may keep working. But just, you know, if you ask Adobe about it, they'll say, yeah, we don't technically support it. I, th I mean, I think, uh, I think you're, you, you may be right. I, I don't have a, I mean, I probably do have a horse in the race. I just don't know it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I do. Actually, if in the spirit of full disclosure, I think everyone should update to the latest version of every 
<laughs> of every font. Yeah, because I work for a, the largest type company in the world. Okay, well, but but why why update? Why why should somebody update? I mean, I understand uh, monotypes interest in that, but I mean, I think for open type features alone, um, that's a reason to sort of update from PostScript type one to open type. Um, Cross-platform compatibility, of course. Um, yeah, and predictable results, I suppose. Mm. Um, as things get older, um, the the latest versions of the fonts will have the latest features in them, and they're just it's more predictable and this supported. Is a, and this is a really important point too that it, it is software. Fonts are software, and they do have versions. That yes. blew my mind when I realized that I was sometimes using older versions of fonts, not just. PostScript type one versus open type, but literally even little mini versions like, you know, dot one, dot two. In InDesign, a lot of people don't realize this. In InDesign, uh, I know you know this, but uh, for, for people who are listening, you can go to the find font dialog box under the type menu, find font, and then, or it's now find replace font, I think, uh, <laughs> and you can click on the uh, more options button and choose a font from the list, and it'll tell you what version of the font you're using. And if you have a different version, you can get very different results, different characters, different versions of a font will have different characters in them. Um, that can be well, wacky. I mean, think for publishers what it means for what that versioning means. So I'm if I'm if I'm setting a page of type or a poster and I have a version 1.1 or version 1.2, it's probably not that big of a deal. Mm. But if I have a 300 page book or a 500 page book and the space changes mm -hmm. the space character changes from and and here i'm revealing inside information changes from 250 units to maybe 247 units right the the way that that will cascade through a book and sort of set off a mm -hmm. series of cataclysmic events yeah editorially yeah um of soft returns and reworked rags and page breaks and all kinds of stuff it's amazing to to um I mean, it's something that easy, it's easy to overlook um, because we're so used to, you know, just, you know, updating, updating in design and sort of working with what the latest version gives us. But the backwards compatibility um, in, a, in a sphere like publishing is is tremendously important. So being able to access that version and knowing that you're working on the precise version. But is really what, important. What, very important. But why would why would a font designer change the size, of the, the width of a space, or what character is at a particular encoding <laughs> space or something? Well, um, there are probably a, a, a myriad of reasons. It might be um, they've gotten consistent complaints from their customers that the word spaces are too wide. Which is, I mean, as a as a typographer and book designer, that was my constant complain okay. like yeah. word spaces are too wide and i understand there's sort of liability issues with spacing <laughs> like how wow. how, a, how a space behaves next to something you know making avoiding crashes so you have you know two characters don't crash because the because the space and the kerning are sort of set up so that there's not um it's not too scant um and you may be i mean the first thing I do in an InDesign document, if I'm trying to fine tune the type, is knock down the word space from 100% to 85%. Hmm. Like you just want a tighter word space so you have better texture. Yeah. Um, so it could be something as as sort of mundane as that complaints from customers that the word spaces are too wide. It could be that in the process of, I mean, there, I I can go through a laundry list of other things it could be, okay. but um, yeah, things like you know adding to the character set um mm. changing changing um or updating the kerning so the kerning that's built into the into mm -hmm. the typeface a lot of things can change the way a typeface flows um and some of them will be genuine improvements to the overall look and feel and functionality of the typeface but they could cause backwards compatibility issues it, it's funny just you, you unintentionally mentioned there's a myriad reasons and of course there's adobe myriad <laughs> um Adobe Myriad has one of the classic examples of font version changing where they, they swapped out a character. Uh, and in InDesign, we see this all the time. Some people, if you launch the, uh, if you look at the bullets, bullets and numbering, if you add a bullet, you'll see a really strange character, something, a character, well, it's probably not a strange character to somebody who understands it, but it's a character that has a lots of different uh, 
something I don't know what it is. And uh, other people, they see the same dialogue box and you actually see something that looks like a bullet. And it's like, what happened? And it turns out that that particular character in that encoding space um, switched at one of the versions of Myriad. And this took me a long time to understand why why two different versions of InDesign or two, even the same version of InDesign on two different computers would look different, why that yeah. dialog box would look different. And it was completely about font versioning. So I love that. Now, um, one other thing about, uh, we started talking about variable fonts. This is really important. Uh, mm. And I think a lot of people um, I kind of got stuck on the whole old fonts, but what about the, these new fonts? Variable fonts um, are fascinating. Can you tell us just a little bit about that and why we would or would not want to touch that? Yeah, I can I can break it down into probably like four or five points. And the first point is the is probably the most major point where families of fonts previously. So if you look at a typeface like I'll go back to Neue Helvetica, and all the different um, different uh, weights and styles in that Neue Helvetica family, um, they were all in in OpenType and in PostScript Type One. They were all separate font files. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to install um, Neue Helvetica sixty seven sort of um, 67 would be a bowl condensed um, you would you would need to have that file and if you wanted 57 55 45 like different weights um, mm -hmm. you would need to have individual font files for it so with so bold semi bold condensed all of those would be separate different files right yep, they're all different fonts so with open type they're all rolled into a single font file so you get one font file. You might get two, one for the Roman and one for the Italic. And our new Helvetica now variable, we have two font files that contain all of the condensed, all of the um, optical sizes, and all of the weights. Um, so all the widths, all the weights, and all the optical sizes in two font files, one for the Italic and one for the Roman. Um, and yeah, it's a tremendous... Um, it's a tremendous... Uh, 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 sort of, it makes life easier. <laughs> it does seem like th there's freedoms there. I mean, you got the freedom to get. I need a little bolder. I need a little bit more. Well, yeah. Then we can go from from the fact that all of those font files are contained within in that um, one font file to how they actually get in there. So they get in there in, in um, along three fundamental conceptual um, paths. The first is this idea of of axes. Um, right, let's talk talk about masters first. So um, all these font styles are derived from master drawings. So you have a drawing on the on one end of the spectrum that will be the thinnest weight of a of a letter, and on the other side you'll have the heaviest weight. And the instances of the typefaces, the things that appear in your font menu, are the parts that populate the the um, space between those two masters. Mm -hmm. So. I'll have a, a very light drawing and a very bold drawing. I'll have a very condensed drawing and a, and a you know regular or expanded drawing. And then I can do optical sizing. I can do as many axes as I want. Um, so the third, the third um, uh, uh, head is axes. So the fact that you can move from light to bold um, or move from condensed to ex expanded they're moving along these these uh, this conceptual axis from one extreme to the other, and a, a variable typeface can have as many of these axes as they want. Most just have a width axis, like they do the sort of the um, that sort of game of moving from light to dark. But I, I like to think of this as uh, a lot of people are familiar in Illustrator with blending, the idea yes. that you can have two different shapes, really com two completely different shapes, and you can blend between those and and then choose one piece out of that and say, I want right. it to look like this shape. I, I think it's very similar te technically, technologically you're, to that. You're right. And you could think, I mean, I, I have a, um, a, a color picker in front of me right now, too, that shows a spectrum from, you know, bright red to, mm. to um, through green, through purple and off to indigo. And I can slide along that and pick any color in that in that spectrum. And it's the same... Um, that's how we have produced type for a long time. We've picked the instances along that spectrum and delivered them as individual individual font files. But now we're delivering the entire spectrum. And so a lot of funny things can happen. Like 
Um, first, we need to design as if every place in that spectrum was a usable typeface. So hmm. it's sort of, um, um, it because I'm giving to you a typeface that allows you to choose between the semi-bold and the bold, something that's a semi-semi-semi-bold, <laughs> um, and you can have your 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 own instance of it, and you could mix in um, a little bit of condensed on it. Um, you can create, you know, one of millions of variations that is, um, that is, it may be the only time it ever gets used. I mean, I've, I've seen fonts. Instance. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've seen fonts that you can change that one of the axes is how much serif does it have? Yes. Right. So you can have more serif or less serif. So you could have something that's a little semi, 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 semi bold mm -hmm. with a, just a little touch of serif. And that's fascinating to give people that, that amount of control. So. Um, as I mentioned um, before, uh, with with those master drawings and with the axes and with this idea of um, of instances, the the number of axes that we're able to build into a typeface are it's it's infinite. There's no uh, upper end to it. It becomes super problematic to imagine a multi dimensional space beyond yeah. <laughs> three. Yeah. Um, but it's possible. Um, there are fundamental axes. So the first axis of fund most fundamental axis is the weight axis um the width axis is next um and then there is a an italic axis and a slant axis which are practically the same thing and then an optical size axis so those are the ones that have built in sort of support um then beyond that i can create something like you said of just like a semi-serif axis i can create an axis called balloon that would cause the typeface to inflate, or I could create right. an axis called tails that would cause the, can, the typeface you, to create to can, grow tails. Can you say something about the optical size axis? That that's interesting to me. Um, so when when um, dinosaurs ruled the earth at the beginning of um, <laughs> of typography um, in the 1450s, 1460s, 1470s, and through to the beginning of the 20th century, my mid mid 19th century. When a type designer designed a typeface, she or he would cut a, uh, an individual letter in the size that it was intended to be used. And as a result of its scale, um, the, there would be subtle um, changes to the form in order to make it appear like something that was cut for a much larger size. So if I was cutting a really big size, I'd cut it one way. And if I was cutting it really small, I'd cut it another way. And the things that, um, that we know as typographers, as type designers that need to be changed when you make something very small is that you need to open up the counter forms. So the spaces inside of the letters need to get more open. You need to reduce the contrast. Even in sans serifs, um, the contrast between the thickest parts of the strokes and the thinnest part of the parts of the stroke need to be reduced so that there's less sparkle to it. Um, mm -hmm. We need to open up the spacing. So you need to put more space on either side of the letter form than you would in a larger size or a text size. Um, and finally, the general shape of the letters tends to be wider. So that's for microtype. And then for text type, that's where most type is designed. Like mm. most of the typefaces on your computer, like Minion um, um, or Adobe Garamond or, you know, Bembo or Plantin, all of those typefaces uh, help. Noya Helvetica is a great example of a typeface that's designed for use in the range of 10 to 12 point. Mm. So that's their sweet spot, most of them. Um, and then there are display typefaces. Um, and those are typefaces that are meant to be used at much larger sizes. And mm. things happen, again, in the vertical proportions. I forgot to mention with microtype that we also in increase the X height, the height of the lowercase x, because it makes the typeface appear to be larger, even though it's actually the same size, right. point size. <clears throat> so when you, get, um, when you get much larger, people mess with proportions in really um, subtle and sometimes dramatic ways. So the typeface can get slightly more condensed letter forms, tighter spacing, maybe a reduced X height. Um, all of these and lots of details within the letter that are going to be seen when it's at that sort of charismatic large size. What optical sizing does is brings that sort of those changes back to a family. That idea that there's a difference between the way the really big type is made and the really little type is made. And with with variable fonts, it creates a spectrum between designs for really large sizes and designs for really small sizes. Mm. And so type uh, programs like InDesign and, um, and type technologies or cascading <laughs> web technologies like CSS mm -hmm. automatically incorporate the optical axis when it's, when it's found. 
Wow. So the the you know InDesign and CSS are looking for that optical axis because it increases the legibility and approachability and sort of beauty of the the yeah. type if it's employed. You actually have to turn it off if you <laughs> if you're using CSS and don't want it to be employed. Wow. That so, was I should mention that was actually in InDesign, I believe that was just implemented. That that optical size feature has been there for 20 years, but I don't think it was ever did anything until about a year ago. And they they right. finally implemented that that checkbox actually does something now right. with 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 the fonts if it has that. So that's very cool. That's very very cool. Um, so variable fonts, lots of options. I have to say, there's a part of me that says. It's scary because of consistency issues. You know, sure. we've all seen, we've all seen pages where it's um, they use lots of different instances of the same kind of font, and it actually looks horrible because there's just too much going on. Because different instances can really be treated as different fonts, and you don't want to have too much going on at the same time. On the other sure. hand, you know, newspapers and there's a lot of small papers that are very excited about this because they can tweak to their heart's content. Uh, and think of, I mean, I think I, I, I'm really thinking of it as this watershed moment in typography because of, I mean, it's very different than multiple masters, which was 20 years ago or 30 years ago, um, a similar concept, but didn't have the sort of necessities of our, of our contemporary design environment. Mm -hmm. I am designing a typeface in variable that, has the ability to um, to change its form, um, and I have to, to some degree, predict what that form change will be and design to it, which sounds exactly like what people who are doing responsive design are doing for, for different device screens. Yes. And the ability of a typeface to, to be programmed to respond to varieties of environments mm. is super exciting. So... If it gets down on a watch screen, can you lighten up the weight a little bit? Or if it gets really small, can you bulk it up a little bit and open up the spacing? Um, there or are a lot of if it's in if you're in dark mode and all of a sudden it's a light on a on a dark background. Yep, choke it a little. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all kinds of stuff you might want to do. Um, let, let's uh, let's shift uh, before we have to finish up. Uh, SVG fonts. So another technology out there, cutting edge. Uh, it's been around for a, for a couple of years now. Uh, SVG fonts, which uh, show up as as open type fonts, you'll still see them as open type fonts. But in InDesign, at least, you get a little SVG icon next to it. Uh, I don't know a lot about them. I've tried a few of them, and they're super cool because yeah. you can get you can get fonts that uh, are like like pixels, like like brush strokes. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get fonts that that change color as how as they move together and so on. What's your sense of SVG? I, I don't think Monotype does SVG right now. Is that right? No, I, I mean it's not that any of us haven't um, experimented or dabbled in SVG, but it's almost a it's almost similar to what was going on in the '60s and '70s in um, lettering versus typography. Mm -hmm. um, and I say versus because there were a lot of people in typography who considered lettering to be a sort of separate art, not typography. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of people now are sort of on the fence about whether SVG is a font or whether it's a form of lettering, sort of almost automated lettering. Oh. But, you know, I think in my in my in my youth, I might have been more sort of dogmatic and, and kept them separated. Um, but I, th you know, it's a big tent typography. <laughs> and um, and I love the idea that you can bring in this sort of this look and feel and immediacy of things that are handmade in a in a typeface. It really blurs the line between um, between the things that are handmade, uh, and it certainly carries, as we talked about at the top, that sort of immediacy of changing the form of the of the words and having it take on a completely different meaning. Mm -hmm. I think so. Uh, I will say it, there seems to be a distinction in the SVG font world between, uh, well, I, I think of it as vector. Vector SVG versus Pixel SVG, yes. and Pixel SVG is is like Photoshop. In fact, there's software that can take Photoshop images and just turn them into a font. So it's all it really is pixel images, bitmapped images that show up as fonts. And so if you make them too big, you're going to see all the little pixels. They're going to get jaggy right. um, as fonts. And that's that's a very weird thing 
to experience. Uh, yeah, and it might be one way of sort of slicing and dicing that that um, that font landscape from, between SVG and you know open type and variable. Um, there, that sort of whether it's a bitmap. I mean, the sheer size of the typeface, not in kilobytes, but in megabytes, yep, um, yep. is is a big rift between. Um, not in the type design community, but in the sort of file community, <laughs> the sure. community of files, like <laughs> something that's so lightweight as a true SVG that's scalable mm. um, versus something that's carrying bitmap data that has a sort of upper limit of where it starts to reveal its bitmapness. And, um, yet, and yet you can do extraordinary things, like you said. I mean, you really have the expression of with transparency inside the bitmaps and so on. So it's yeah. it's kind of amazing. Um maybe less relevant for print. Um, printing actually is a big problem, C can be a big problem, let me put it that way, with both kinds of SVG, both pixel and vector SVG fonts. Um, there are some challenges there, and I've seen some uh, uncomfortable stuff happening, happening, even if you export to, to Acrobat, I, I'm sorry, export to PDF, and you open it in Acrobat, you can get some weird stuff that you need to proof for. I just want to warn mm -hmm. people out there. Yes. SVG fonts, Cutting edge technology, it's you can do amazing things, but you do have to be careful because sometimes things get really, really wonky and may not print the way you expect. Yeah, and it, I mean, there's one of those instances where you might want to to do the type in in Photoshop and then hit the upper limit of its um, of its uh, screen resolution or file resolution, and then import that into InDesign as an image as opposed to using it as type. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a good idea in a lot of cases. Um, but it's, I, I do encourage people to try them. I, I want to I get people to try their technology because as people try it and experiment with, with these technologies, they'll push them to crazy limits and then they'll say that doesn't work and we'll start to see what does work. Uh, and I think we're going we're gonna to start putting more pressure on the powers that be, the people who are you know, Adobe and Monotype and other companies that are... Um, I think everybody's going to start to say, okay, well, what can we do with this and uh, safely? What can we do safely with this? Yeah, and I, I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine designers being afraid of a new technology. But I do know that, you know, some people do shy away from things until other people's, people have tested them. But the truest among us are designers <laughs> who, you know, when they hear the alarm go off, they run towards it, not away from it. I love that. I um, love that. We but need you know, to experiment. I think that's true, and yet fonts. Um, actually, l last week I just got a uh, uh, some on our forums. I was just answering a, a message because somebody was saying, "Yeah, you know, I have the, I only have a true type font. I know I'm not supposed to use true type fonts." So I and I thought, "Wait, wait, wait!" And I remember this is this. There are all these myths that start growing up around Gosh, fonts. Yes, you're like right. you shouldn't use true type. That's a myth. Yep. So a lot of true, true type fonts are fine. It's just a different format. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm always, I want to be careful that I want to encourage people to try stuff and don't get too caught up in the myths of, oh, yeah, the, I'm not allowed to use that because that's not going to work. It might work. Yeah. In fact, it often will work. So. Yeah, the line between true type and open type anymore, um, or postscript and true type, it's super blurry. Um, yeah. I mean, you can have an open type font that is a true type outline. I mean, this is really inside baseball, but um, buried within, a, you know, some people say, I only want TTFs, but we give them an OTF and they don't realize that it's a TTF outline inside of an OTF wrapper. Right, right. <laughs> Just, people, people. It's it super confusing. It can be very confusing. Same thing with Postscript. Postscript type one fonts inside of, of an open type font. And right. I'm assuming that even after 2023, I'm assuming that a Postscript font inside uh, inside of an OTF wrapper, a op open type font wrapper will continue working. Yep, I would imagine so. Sure. I mean, that uh, if you don't change anything about the PostScript Type One font, you just convert it into an OTF. Um, nothing, I mean, nothing substantial should change. It's just it doesn't have any of the functionality of an open type font, um, but it will. It should still function just like it did before. We, we've really come full circle here around around from open from type one to the the crazy stuff of uh, variable and SVG and then back to type one. So um, we should wrap this up. Um, 
I have so many more questions though that I yeah, want to ask. Me too. But let's let's um, we're gonna we're gonna close this up and then go over to the Q and A room where we can actually answer questions from the audience as well, or or keep talking about any of this. So this is going to be fun. Uh, thank you so much, Charles. This is awesome, uh, and we'll 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 see you over in the Q and A room. Thank you, David.